Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name's Justin. Today we're taking a look at the drummer for Bruno Mars, which happens to be his brother, Eric E. Panda Hernandez. Now, Bruno actually does a lot of the drumming for the albums himself. It gets overdubbed and Eric does stuff too. It's kind of a complicated process, but the live act is all Eric E. Panda Hernandez. We'll be taking a look at the acoustic drums, of course, but with a heavy emphasis on how he incorporates electronics into his setup and how that makes his live show better. I like looking at drummers that play for stadiums and really large venues because they have a whole different set of priorities than the average drummer. And of course, the biggest factor is how close does the artist want your drum set to sound like the album? That is the key on how deep into electronics you end up going. We'll break down each of his setups in a second, but first, let's go back to where it all started. Eric Hernandez got his first gig playing live drums at the age of 10 in Hawaii. He made money doing shows for seven straight years. When he turned 18, Eric moved to Los Angeles. He wanted to break into that much larger music scene. But it turns out competition to get into a good paying band is absolutely brutal out there. After a while, Eric began running low on money. He started picking up jobs before switching careers to become a police officer. His entire drumming career was almost snuffed out just like that. His DW drum set sat dusty in a garage for eight years. But we all know it's nearly impossible to squash the drumming bug once you've got it. Eric would find himself randomly tapping on tables at the police station all the time. Now the big change in his life began when his brother Bruno Mars decided that he also wanted to leave Hawaii and move to California. Bruno successfully broke into the music scene after a ton of effort and began climbing the charts. Here's a quote from an interview that Eric did with Mike Dolbear, which I'll link below. Now, Bruno wanted to buy instruments for the house. He was like, why don't you play drums? So he bought me an electronic drum set, a Roland TD-7. He brought the kit into my house. He had a guitar and keyboard set up, and we were jamming in the living room. One friend bought a house and said, hey, we'll pay you 300 bucks. Come play our house warming party. So my brother called one of his producer friends who plays keyboard, and the guy's like, all right, let's do it. We end up doing this house party and we killed it. The very next week, I was going to local pubs in my neighborhood saying, hey, I got a three piece band, what do you think? Take a chance, we'll take a hundred bucks plus tips or whatever. So we had an every Wednesday night gig. I was playing my electronic drum set at pubs and it was great. So now that we've got his background out of the way, let's move ahead to 2011. The setup here is pretty simple. Just a Roland SPDS to the left of the drum set. There's also possibly a side snare with a drum trigger on it like a Roland RT-10S. It's hard to say for sure though, because the footage is pretty low res. He was using this very minimalist electronic integration for quite a while. When asked about his electronics in a 2012 interview, here's what he said. With the Bruno show, there's no playback. So I'm the drummer and percussionist and effects guy. We use sampler pads and I trigger some samples from the record, some 808 sounds. We experimented with some triggers on the snare, but more so I just hit the pad. I may expand, but I'm kind of a caveman when it comes to programming my electronics. Thank God for my drum tech. Now jumping forward a year, this is the drum set that he used on SNL. It's pretty much the same thing. One roll in SPDS to the left. When it comes to the acoustic drums, the shell sizes, and the cymbal choices, I'll put them up here on screen. You'll see a lot of experimentation in the drum sizes especially until he really locks it in later around 2017-2020. Now later that year on the Moonshine Jungle Tour, he did start making some changes. He switched over to the Roland SPD-SX. It had been out for a while then, originally launching in 2011. But as I've noticed, pro drummers don't always immediately jump on the latest gear if what they already have still works. The next big change is that Eric started to include some Roland PDX pads, one next to the floor tom and one to the left. They connect into the back inputs of the Roland SPD-SX, which powers them. On the acoustic side of things, we start seeing more experimentation again, here are the cymbal choices and the drum choices, still sticking with DW and Sabian. Now, as far as I can tell, his setup was pretty consistent from around 2013 to 2016, but a big shift happened in 2017. That's where he went into rehearsals for the 24K Magic Tour and started to cobble together a different setup. So let's start off with the electronic side of things. Eric decided to add a Roland KT-10 kick drum pedal on the floor. I love this thing because it's high quality, has a weighted feel that you can modify to fit your playing style, and it has a very small footprint. It's definitely a helpful tool that came in handy when Eric least expected it. That kick drum pedal saved me during one of our very first shows, where I put a drum beater right through my kick drum head in the middle of a show. If I didn't have that trigger pedal, I wouldn't have had a kick drum. I probably would have been playing all the kick drum patterns on my floor tom to cover until I could find time for my drum tech to come and fix it. 
The KT-10 wasn't really meant for that, it was meant for me to have the ability to do an 808 bass note. But after that incident, and it saving me, now it's my backup kick drum. So it's kind of like you wouldn't miss it. It would hopefully be seamless. But by far, the biggest shift that he made to his electronics was the sound source. After using various Roland sample pads for years, he decided to just get rid of them. Here's a quote from an interview where he explains why. What I wanted to do for this tour was eliminate the small pads. I used to use a Roland SPDSX all the time. It's a great unit and a great tool. But when I'm trying to watch Bruno, who's moving all across the stage, and there's some sounds that I have to trigger on cue, whether it's a vocal or a lot of times a physical cue, if I'm looking at him and my hand is here, my hand would miss occasionally. And then later, I get the look of death back. Why'd you miss that? Because it's a crucial sound. Might have been some type of snap or a clap or whatever it may be. By taking a Roland TD50 brain, I was able to get more pads so I could spread it around the kit. It's easier to find these bigger electronic drum pads than finding a square on the SPDSX. So I would assign specific sounds for each song on each pad. The larger V drum next to my hi-hat was my electronic snare. If there was an electronic snare specific sound, I used that. The other ones were miscellaneous sounds. Claps, wind chimes, snaps, and 808 drops. So there you have it. I'm glad to know that I'm not the only person that struggles to hit those 4 inch rubber squares. Let alone in the dark. I think that's a pretty good reason for the change, and it makes perfect sense. The TD50 gives him way more flexibility and so many more drum pad inputs, and he fully takes advantage of that feature. The total number of electronic elements now has ballooned up to about 10 pieces. The number of PDX pads has jumped to 4 to 5 depending on the gig. He also started using a bunch of Roland BT1 bar triggers. And because they have a black surface that's hard to see when the lights go out, sometimes his drum tech puts strips of glow tape on them for increased visibility. And like he said in the interview, now he has a larger roll and side snare to the left. I'm guessing this is a PD-108, possibly. It's some sort of pad from the Roland TD-30 or TD-50 series of drums. And he only uses that to trigger electronic snare sounds. All right, so next up on the left of his kick drum pedal, he used to have a foot switch on the floor. It was used to change kits between songs, so the samples on each drum pad were always swapped out and correct for each song he was playing. But of course, no matter where you put the button, it's always going to be in the back of your mind, slightly stressing you and stealing your focus away from playing the songs. So Eric transitioned later on to just having his drum tech, Jason Bowers, change the kits for him. So Jason sits at the TD50 module just out of view of the drum set and makes it all happen. So next up, I really want to cover his drum throne because it's a custom Porter & Davies BC2. If you take a look at the bottom of the throne, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a cable running into it. This ties directly into your audio feed, and your drum throne shakes every single time you hit your kick drum. Or you can have it where the bass feed goes in there as well. It sounds kind of dumb on the surface, but believe me, it's really cool if you sit down and try it in person. It makes you feel more connected to your drumming, even on an acoustic drum set. The price tag is really ugly though. This whole system costs $1,300, but of course, I'm pretty sure he got this for free because Porter and Davies literally sent him a custom one with his name engraved on it. I, I'm guessing that was a free gift from them just to promote the brand. Now, there are cheaper alternatives to this piece of gear, like the butt kicker. It's an attachment that you can put on the bottom of any drum throne, but this has it built in, making it very unique. And then finally, let's touch on some of the acoustic drums and the changes that we saw from around 2017 to 2020. It turns out he was working with PDP in 2018 to create a custom snare. Bringing back the piccolo, the piccolo snare drum, because I feel like there's a little void out there right now with piccolos, and hey, this is a classic sound, this is a classic drum that shouldn't be forgotten about, because including myself, I've gone to the deep snares and, and followed that train, and sometimes we forget there's a lot of depth that you can get from from a shallow shell. Now for the cymbals, it's nearly impossible to nail down every single crash cymbal that he's gone through. Everything from the artisan stuff, AA, HH, AAX, and HHX. The cymbal lineup that I have on screen is from 2017, and of course he's made changes since then. According to the man himself, he always wants to choose the right tool for the album. That's why eventually he started using slightly smaller crash cymbals overall. It turns out those monster 20-inch crashes that he loves so much are in the same frequency range as Bruno Mars' vocals. They kind of clash, so he decided to make the choice to find a better sonic fit with smaller cymbal sizes. 
The other change that you'll see from his 2013 and 2016 kits is that he's gone just pure maple instead of maple and mahogany plies. The whole drum set and even his fills have shifted towards a more 90s sound, and whenever Bruno Mars' next solo album comes out, I'm sure he'll make further changes to make his drum set fit that sound too. And that's the video. Hope you guys now have a decent grasp on how the drummer for Bruno Mars uses electronics in his setup, and also the evolution of his acoustic equipment as well. I find all this really interesting, and I hope you did too. Have an awesome day, and I'll see you all in a few.